Donald Glover, otherwise known as Childish Gambino, is a multi-talented, incredibly influential artist, actor, singer, writer, director, you name it. Donald has done many things throughout his career. Can y'all let me all you want? I've seen enough movies to know that popping the back of a raft makes it go faster. And things that most people don't even know about the guy because of how secretive he is. This will be me covering Donald Glover as a person and his musical stage name Childish Gambino. This video took me a, a very long time to make. I spent a week just writing a 50 page script for this video so I hope you guys enjoy it. Timestamps and the guide are in the description. And also I put everything that is in the iceberg in the description of the video so you can follow along if you want. If not, it's there anyways. Shoutouts to Pingyu on Reddit as I use his iceberg as a template but I simply added three to four extra pages of content to that iceberg so mine is actually going to be pretty different. As even I added a completely extra layer that wasn't even on this iceberg originally. Again, a full guide will be in the description. Make sure you guys enjoy. Like, comment, and subscribe. Shout out to Ping You on Reddit. Enjoy the video. For those who don't know what an iceberg is, at the top of the iceberg, it starts off with stuff people are mostly going to know. Then by the end of it, it's going to be more stuff that people probably don't know about the person or the topic. Now, when it comes to this video, I will say some of the stuff in the beginning of the iceberg I might not go into as much depth because most people have either talked about this thing to death or most people already know it. But as we get more deeper and depths get lower in the iceberg, it's going to be more stuff that people usually don't know about Donald Glover or Childish Gambino. So I hope you guys enjoy. Take care. This is a huge passion project for me. Layer 1. This is America. Easily Childish Gambino's most infamous song in his career. The 2018 music video for This Is America pretty much had the entire world knowing its existence with moments of melancholy mixed with violence throughout the video. It goes without saying it's probably Childish Gambino's most infamous song and video in his career. In fact, this song won multiple Grammys and awards and to this day this song went triple platinum in the United States. It's easily one of his biggest songs, most people probably know its existence and obviously most people have talked about this song probably way too much. Obviously, if you've seen any video about This Is America, they'll tell you that it has obvious racial undertones laced throughout the music video, and seeing that, it's pretty obvious. So I won't say too much because this is the most well-known thing about Childish Gambino. Redbone. The number one single off 2016's Awaken My Love, Redbone comes halfway through the album as a very nocturnal and vocal song. It's probably one of Gambino's most impressive vocal performances due to the entire song being in a higher pitch than what Gambino was normally known to sing in. The song was a sleeper hit when it came out, but over time became a meme in 2017 and started to climb up the charts again. It's also infamous for being in Jordan Peele's Get Out, and a little bit of trivia about the song is Gambino started the initial first drafts of Redbone singing in a normal pitch, but once he went to a higher octave, it's when the track started to mold into its own thing. This is my personal favorite Gambino track of all time. It's very good and I really like his vocal performance, especially live. Also, the Jimmy Fallon performance of this song still slaps to this day. Atlanta Atlanta is a TV show created by Donald Glover that is on the channel FX. Gambino stated in interviews all the way back in 2014 that he started working on a TV show. And this show would one day materialize in September 6, 2016, being FX's Atlanta. Right now, the TV show is filming its third and fourth season, and the show is a pretty dark comedy where I would say it's filled with a lot of commentary of the music industry and what it means to be black in America. I will talk more about some of the more iconic and maybe more interesting things in the show in later parts of the iceberg, but the top of the iceberg, I'll just talk about the show in a pretty general way. Donald Glover stars as Earn. Also, there's Brian Tyree Henry as Paperboy, Lakeith Stanfield as Darius, and Disease Beats as Earn's on and off again girlfriend. Simba the Lion King. Donald Glover plays Simba in the 2019 Disney live action remake of The Lion King, where he stars alongside Beyonce. There really isn't that much to say about this, although it does have Donald Glover singing a few songs in the movie. And it's still a little iconic because he used to make references to Simba in some of his earlier songs in his discography. Lando Calrissian Solo Donald Glover plays the iconic Star Wars character Lando Calrissian in the Star Wars prequel film Solo A Star Wars Story, where he's playing a pretty much younger version of Lando Calrissian 
And he did get the original actor who played Lando back in the day. He did get his blessing to play this character, and he does a really good job. Despite all the controversy that surrounded this film, Donald's performance is really good in this film, so I, I recommend it if you're a huge Donald Glover fan. Troy Barnes, Community. Good news, guys. I spent all my money. Troy, you can't bring that in here. Yes, I can. It's all terrain, dummy. Easily one of Donald Glover's most iconic roles as playing the college kid Troy Barnes in the show Community with a huge ensemble cast. This is easily the role that Donald is most known for and many Gambino fans started figuring him out on this show basically. He would eventually leave the show during the fifth season in order to more intently pursue his music career. And yes, there's clear references to Childish Gambino during his very last appearance in the show. Donald Glover and the cast of Community all seem like they're pretty tight and they're still friends to this day so, you know, maybe we'll get that six seasons in a movie. I mean, we did get six seasons, but maybe we'll get that movie one day. Who knows? Crossing my fingers still. Awaken My Love Awaken My Love is probably Gambino's most well-known and refined album, and yes, it's my personal favorite album from him. It's pretty amazing. This album has Redbone on it, Me and Your Mama, Terrified, Stand Tall, Riot, Boogeyman, and a lot of really amazing songs that are just on this project. Fun fact, when this album first came out, it really came out from like left field because no one expected Gambino to make a funk and soul inspired album. And Gambino's singing on this album is really the forefront of the experience. It's pretty amazing and to listen to some of his early mixtapes and then listen to this album and realize it's the same person who made Bonfire, it's pretty crazy. Anyways, this album really is inspired from other funk and soul albums and it's pretty much a love letter to genres from the 70s. Even the album's cover art being inspired from Funkadelic's Maggot Brain, which Gambino stated in an interview being one of his favorite albums of all time. Funkadelic, Maggot Brain, this is like one of my favorite albums ever. Maggot Brain is like one of my favorite songs and it used to give me nightmares when I was a kid. Uh, I used to see this and like there's a skull on the back too and I didn't know what it was about but my dad loved it, like really loved it. Plenty of songs on the album have similar riffs and production similarities to popular songs that came out in the 70s like Bootsy Collins music, Funkadelic, and even the Isley Brothers to name a few. I would show the similarities between some of the popular music that came out around the 70s and Awaken My Love because some of them are really strikingly similar. But yeah, Gambino pretty much wears his influences on his sleeve for this album. Oh yeah, and another fun fact, there is no music video that was released with this album. So I just thought that was an interesting thing to mention that this album did pretty well for not having any music videos. Layer 2. Music videos. Now if Gambino is doing a music video, there's usually some sort of meaning towards the video. He doesn't really do self-loathing basic music artist videos like some people do. Usually his music videos have some sort of message that people can dig into. So Gambino actually has a storyline connected to some of his music videos, and I'm going to dissect a few of them. Even as early in the Bonfire music video, Gambino begins a video with the noose around his neck, and he slowly goes throughout the video trying to talk to people, while the entire time people don't really know his existence. He then goes throughout the music video trying to tell his friends that there's some sort of killer in the woods without anyone noticing. Then the ending of the music video is in the exact same spot where he started with the noose around his neck again. Now I will say when it comes to a Childish Gambino music video, there's probably going to be many interpretations, but I will go with some of the top theories that are out there and also make some connections to other videos. In the Bonfire music video, it seems that Gambino's character is dead and therefore a ghost. And it seems that he was killed decades earlier due to the style of clothing that he's wearing in the video which is extremely short shorts and a v-neck shirt. And the reason why he's probably dead is because he was, well, lynched, and he's trying to tell other people at the camp to run, but he can't because he's dead. Some people have found some of the themes in the video similar to a Twilight Zone episode called An Occurrence at All Creek, where they share similar themes of being unable to escape death, and how the protagonists are shaped by that throughout the story. In the episode, a man is about to be hung by Union soldiers until the rope snaps and he manages to escape, almost drowning and swims away to the shore so the Union soldiers are unable to kill him. He manages to run and escape from his impending doom and he finds his family, and he reunites with his wife. Until the episode juxtaposes with him reuniting with his family to him actually being hung and killed by the Union soldiers. It shows the inability of trying to escape death. 
and it plays on how our protagonists are mostly portrayed in films as always being able to get out of trouble, when in reality it isn't always the case. How this relates to the Gambino video is similar themes seem to be present and how the video is shot and him being juxtaposed exactly to where he started at the end of the video. With the other videos in Gambino's library, they are more connected to each other. All the music videos during the Because the Internet era are meant to play off of each other and are seemingly connected to each other. Starting with Sweatpants. The video starts with Childish Gambino entering a diner, and during his entire time in the diner, he is talking to friends. It's clear throughout the video that his friends aren't really acknowledging his existence, so he goes outside to check on his phone. Then when he goes back inside, the video actually jumps to the beginning of the music video again. It's a pretty blink and you'll miss it moment. The video begins to loop, except this time Gambino begins to notice that people have the exact same face as him. Meaning literally people are becoming himself. And it seems no one is really noticing this, so he begins to look paranoid as more people start to stare at him when more people in the video start to become himself. The video begins to loop again back to the start, entering the restaurant, with pretty much everyone looking at him at this point. The music video ends with Gambino snapping at the line, I don't give a fuck about my family name, and everyone around him is staring at him, as if he did something wrong, snapping in the midst of a mental breakdown. The video then transitions to the song Earn, which is a more melancholy track that is off BTI, and Gambino seems to be singing in some sort of dark valley outside. It seems to represent some sort of world or afterlife, with many people dancing juxtaposed with Gambino standing there sideways. Now analyzing this video, it will fit the other narratives to BTI, but the main meaning behind this video is Gambino is some sort of alien and doesn't feel like he is connecting with anyone. And this is one of the main themes of BTI, but the whole thing about being an alien is a representation of being black in America and being lost. Which is definitely one of the things Gambino is feeling during the BTI era, as it's pretty obvious Gambino was going through some trouble during the BTI era, even almost committing suicide. He was definitely in some sort of midst of a midlife crisis where he was having a lot of trouble leaving community and he just ended a long time relationship that he was in at the time. This led to Gambino having an existential crisis that definitely was evident in the BTI era. The next video for The Worst Guy shows Gambino partying with some of his friends and Chance the Rapper also being featured in the video. But eagle eyed viewers will notice that in the video there seems to be Gambino is getting affected by some sort of tentacle monster in the video. And this is pretty much going to be evident in other videos that this really does happen, where in Telegraph Avenue, Gambino eventually transforms into a monster near the end of the video and he's being hunted down for being an alien. Again, another obvious parallel to being black in America. The music video for 3005 concludes with Gambino's alien form causing some sort of apocalypse. And this bear that's also in the video is the only thing that remains living. As the music video for 3005 goes on, people begin to get old and eventually disappear from the carousel ride. And the carousel ride being an obvious representation of life on Earth being that even Gambino eventually disappears at the very end of the video, and the only thing remaining is this bear, and it's tattered and destroyed. Representing when people will get old, they eventually will become something very different from when they started the carousel ride. Gambino pretty much confirms that this vibe was true in the song 3005, as it's more of an existential song than a love song, and people not being able to reach 3005 but most people think that this is some bubbly pop song when really the lyrics are much darker. The last video I'll go over in this segment because I know this is getting long is Sober. It appears the alien character returns in this music video and you can tell because Gambino's eyes have a heavy amount of eye shadow during the video and Gambino is seemingly trying to impress this woman during the entire video. He eventually begins to start dancing and doing some sort of alien-like dance and the lights start shifting throughout the video. The video is trying to show the lengths he's willing to go to make a connection with another person. And this person, being the woman, initially is impressed and interested in what he's doing, but eventually she leaves the diner without him and he ends the video exactly where he started in the music video. Showing that connection is hard to make and another touch being that the clock doesn't even move during the entire video, 
showing that this is a loop. Guava Island Guava Island was a film starring Donald Glover, and it features Rihanna in the film. The film is sort of a musical in a way, where it has many moments in the film that break, and Donald Glover's character, Danny, will sing songs. A lot of unreleased Gambino songs are actually in this movie, for example, the song Saturday being in this film, as it was never released officially. There's a remix of This Is America. Also another easter egg in this film is one of the songs that made it onto 31520 made its first appearance in this movie, being Time which features Ariana Grande. There are some kids in this movie that are actually singing lyrics straight out of the song before it was even officially released. So Gambino's definitely being a little bit of a cheeky person here, leaking stuff a little bit early so you come back and be like, oh I remember that. So yeah, go watch the film if you're a diehard Gambino fan. I would say that's really what the film is aimed towards is the diehard Gambino fans, but it's obviously a passion project by Donald. It didn't get reviewed the greatest, but like I said, it's a Gambino project to show the parallels between black and America, being a commodity, and how it affects the culture. If you want to watch it yourself, definitely check it out. Otherwise, I'm going to leave some of the spoilers out because there are spoilers in this movie. But check it out if you're a diehard fan. Because the internet. Easily one of Gambino's most infamous albums, being released in the tail end of 2013. Fun fact, Gambino's label would try to fight him to not release this album during the winter time because it would compete with a lot of Christmas albums. But Gambino stated Christmas as being the best time to release an album like this because there's a lot of time for everyone inside and people have time to recharge. This album starts out with a lot of bangers and a lot of them mostly becoming well-known songs after they were released. Sweatpants, 3005, Telegraph Avenue, The Worst Guys, World Star, just to name a few. But the album around the halfway point becomes much darker and existential with songs like The Party, Zelts of Stockholm, Urn, and it's meant to parallel the existential crisis that Gambino was going through at the time. The album also came out with an accompanying screenplay that is meant to be read while listening to the album. Some people either really like the screenplay, although you don't really need to read it in order to enjoy the album, and the screenplay has a lot of themes that are apparent in the music especially even the music videos that are also accompanying this album. Mainly, I will talk about the themes that surround this album maybe a little bit later in the iceberg, but just know that this is one of the most popular albums in the community. It's probably my second favorite Gambino project, it's definitely one of his most memorable projects for sure. It's a lot of other people's favorite projects, so definitely check it out if you're a huge fan. Spider-Man Homecoming appearance? No, 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 no. Come fix this. Two hours. You deserve that. I got ice cream in You deserve here, that. Man. You're a criminal. Bye, Mr. Criminal. Donald Glover was cast as the Prowler, Miles Morales' uncle, in Spider-Man Homecoming, which is pretty much an accumulation of all the hype between Donald Glover being Black Spider-Man in the early 2010s. But again, I will talk about Donald for Spider-Man maybe a little bit later in the iceberg, but just knowing a lot of the hype led to Donald Glover eventually becoming in the MCU as Miles' uncle where he would specifically reference Miles in some deleted scenes for the film. It's definitely an interesting take for sure, and you can watch these clips on YouTube of Donald in this movie. His SNL appearance. Donald Glover's SNL appearance in May of 2018. Donald Glover was the host of SNL, where he would get a lot of good bits and show his more comedic side during the show, and he would later state that back in the day he auditioned for being in the cast of SNL, but was ultimately rejected and now he's hosting SNL and being a musical act at the same time. These bits are really funny as Donald Glover would state that his time at SNL felt like the old days where he could be silly. And you can really tell from his performance. On top of that, there's some really funny bits like the Kanye West bit that's inspired from Quiet Place. He would debut the song Saturday for the first time, which is an unreleased song to this day, but it's pretty beloved in the community. Also, this song would be shown in Guava Island, released a year later. And then he would premiere his hit song, This Is America, which would be officially released the next day. Andrew Yang Consultant. Donald Glover was actually the creative consultant for Andrew Yang during his presidential campaign in 2020. There was a few exclusive merch release between this and also the campaign, and Donald Glover would appear in some of his campaign tour appearances. Although Donald Glover co-signing Andrew Yang wasn't enough for him to win, this would eventually lead to Andrew Yang's campaign ending. Dare Comedy was Donald Glover's early college sketch comedy group that would eventually be on YouTube with many iconic skits. 
The main group would be Donald Glover, DC Pearson, and Dominic Derricks. During their time at New York University, they would work on their internet sketch group, and they would later grow larger on YouTube because of the general lack of sketch comedy content that was on YouTube in the late 2000s. The comedy group would be responsible for Donald Glover actually getting a role on Community and his writing role on 30 Rock. The community casting directors actually watched the Do You Like Hip Hop skit, and they thought it was hilarious, and that's partly why they hired him on the show. Sorry, hey, do you like hip hop? Yeah, yeah, I like hip hop. You like hip hop? Yeah, sure. Really? 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 You really like hip hop? Yeah, I really like hip hop, yes. Come with me. Oh my god, that's Jay-Z's body. Exactly, and I'm gonna let you cop that for 50 bones. This was pretty much Donald Glover's start in humble beginnings being on this YouTube channel. And plenty of the videos would reach a million views. So some of the iconic ones being the National Spelling Bee, the Black Peter Pan, and although some of these sketches would age better than others, Gambino even referencing that he didn't want to be defined by one of the sketches for the entirety of his career, it was still important for his humble beginnings. The comedy troupe would do improv competitions, later create their own feature film called Mystery Team, which is a good watch if you're a hardcore fan of Donald. The other members in Dare Comedy would get writing gigs for other shows, and DC Pearson would actually play minor characters in a lot of the MCU films. Camp is Childish Gambino's. This might not be one of my favorite albums, but it's definitely one that the fan base holds dear to their hearts. The final track on the album is about Gambino's inability to grow up and, spoiler alert, move off the bus after he gets rejected and humiliated by a girl that he liked in summer camp. This ends up being the starting narrative for the screenplay for Because the Internet, which is basically Gambino getting off that summer camp bus. Critically, there are some nice themes on this album, but Gambino as an artist is pretty much moved past this sound. He doesn't even play songs off this album anymore during live performances. But hardcore Gambino fans do love this album, and it's a really great start for a debut album. 30 Rock Now I'm sure most of you know what 30 Rock is, but for those who don't, it was a sitcom created in 2006 and went all the way to 2013, starring Tina Fey, Alec Baldwin, and Tracy Morgan, to name a few. Donald Glover was hired as a writer for the show because Tina Fey saw his talent in one of his Derek Comedy Sketch Group videos, and Donald Glover would later cite that the only reason he was hired was because he was black and also a writer and 30 Rock didn't really have many black writers, especially some that were young. Donald would write for the show for a couple years and then eventually decided to take his own avenues more seriously, like doing stand-up and music, and then later becoming part of the cast and community. He does cameo in a few scenes in the show for those who are interested. 3, 15, 20, and Donald Glover Presents. Childish Gambino, or should I say Donald Glover's latest studio album, originally leading up to the release of this project, Childish Gambino went on the record saying that his next album was going to be his final album. But soon after a couple years later, after the release of 31520, he later retracted that statement and said he was working on music again. So going into this, a lot of people's first listens of this project were originally that this was going to be Gambino's last project. And for some people, they either really liked this album or they didn't. And in my opinion, it does have some strong songs on the project, but there are some questionable moments for sure. But the good songs definitely shine through on this project nonetheless, so if you look at the name of the project, it represents the day it came out, which was roughly the time when the nationwide lockdown began and everyone was forced indoors. And the album also has a completely white cover art, which some people didn't really know if it was intentional or if he was literally putting out an album that didn't even have cover art. The other icing on the cake is literally the tracks on this project don't have actual names, instead being referred to by timestamps of when they appear on the album. Which is strange nonetheless, but I don't know it has something to do with what Gambino wanted to do with the project. We would find out later that the tracks did have actual names to them, it's just Gambino chose not to use them. So the timestamps are representing mainly the placement that they are on the album of the Donald Glover Presents livestream, which was the first time this project was debuted was on this live stream. Meaning that Donald Glover planned for this project to probably be listened in one sitting, and I'm guessing he wants people to see this as one single project instead of a normal traditional tracklist album. Either way, despite all this, some people wonder why the live stream was called Donald Glover Presents and not Childish Gambino Presents, 
and if Gambino is abandoning his stage name and just going by Donald Glover. That confirmation has yet to be seen officially. Either way, it's a pretty mixed project for the fanbase. I think it has some decent parts on it. It's nowhere near his best, but it's not horrible either. I have a conspiracy theory that he dropped this because 2020 went through a trash compactor and everybody was just stuck inside and he was like, you know what, let's just drop a project instead. Marshall Lee. Marshall Lee is from the show Adventure Time, and it's actually played by Donald Glover himself. He plays a few songs on the show and sings. Other than that, there's not really much to say here. Donald for Spider-Man. The Donald for Spider-Man hashtag went viral on Twitter after Marvel announced that they were making their own black Spider-Man character, Miles Morales. That began people fan casting their own versions of the character, and the most popular version actually being Donald Glover to play that character. It went so viral that not only did this result in Donald Glover being hired as Miles Morales' uncle in Spider-Man Homecoming, but not only that, he would get roles where he would actually voice the character in some animated TV shows. There were plenty of easter eggs in Community where Donald Glover would wake up in a Spider-Man suit on, and this would even be referenced in the Spider-Verse as well. The Twitter hashtag would eventually end up in a lot of Donald's stand-up specials at the time where he would mention how the hilarity of all the people on the internet wanting him to be Spider-Man and the positives and negatives that came with that. Half the world was like, Donald for Spider-Man, we're only gonna watch the next Spider-Man of Donald Glover's playing Peter Parker. And the other half was like, he's black, kill him! Like it was so fast. Weirdo. Donald Glover's 2012 stand-up special, which actually came out on DVD and is now on Netflix. His relationship with stand-up was always something other comedians would envy because he landed a lot of stand-up specials with also being on a network television show, and him also being Childish Gambino at the same time. Donald Glover did do a lot of stand-up in the early 2010s, but after a few specials he began to focus on acting and be um, more of a musician. Slowly, comedy was something he didn't really do anymore after time went on, stating in an interview that music reaches more wavelengths that comedy can't hit. But talking about the special, the special is actually really funny. Some of my favorite bits being the bit where he compares AIDS to having a baby. The Home Depot story is also a really funny bit in the sketch. And it's also on Netflix if you're interested in watching it. It's on there. You can watch it now. Deleted Instagram notes. These notes relate to the BTI era and Gambino's career. This era represents a very existential time period in Donald Glover's life. He just recently left his network television show, Community and he wanted to focus more on music and other projects. He mentions in interviews being scared and not knowing what exactly he was going to do and he was just going to move forward in life. In some interviews he stated that he tried taking his own life. All this happening after a relationship ending, even though he was supposedly going to marry this girl, and this girl was rumored to be DJ Super Sam. So while making BTI, Gambino spiraled into an existential crisis that would sort of develop into this character called The Boy during the BTI era, which we'll talk more about The Boy later in the iceberg, but just know that's what Gambino was doing at the time. I'll link the full letter of these notes in the description, you can read the whole thing. I'll read some of it off right now. I'm afraid of my future. I'm afraid my parents will live long enough to see my kids. I'm afraid my show will fail. I'm afraid my girl will get pregnant at the exact time we don't want to. I'm scared I'll never reach my potential. I'm afraid she's still in love with that dude. I feel like I'm letting everyone down. I'm afraid people hate me, who I really am. I'm afraid I hate who I really am. I'm scared people will find out. I'm afraid I'm here for nothing. I feel like I might feel pretentious. I'm scared people will think I hate my own race. I'm afraid people think I hate women. I hate people who, who can just say anything. I hate caring what people think. And then skipping around, he says, I didn't leave community to rap. I don't want to rap. I want to be my own. I've been sick this year. I've seen a bunch of people die this year. This is the first time I felt helpless, but I'm not on that. The label doesn't want me to release in December because it's not a holiday record and I'm not a big artist. I started the record last Christmas. Christmas always made me feel lonely, but it helped me restart the next year. I want people to use this album when everything is closed, when everything slows down and quiet, so you can start over. I got really lost last year, but I can't be lonely though because we're all here and we're all stuck. I wanted to make something that says no matter how bad you fuck up or make mistakes you've made last year, your life, your eternity, you're always allowed to do better. You're always allowed to grow up if you want. 
And again, this is kind of referencing some parts of earlier things in Gambino's career, like his camp album and so on and so forth. He lists a lot of his insecurities at the time, mainly about growing up, his relationships, feeling helpless. Also concluding this letter, he says he wants to release the album during the winter time when everything slows down, but his label doesn't want him to release it when he wants to. The news media at the time had no idea how to paint this. They had no idea if it was some stunt to promote this album, or if he was actually going to end his own life. This led to many people thinking there was something wrong with him, but there were people that understood what he was going through and could relate with some of his feelings of feeling lost and lacking direction. Collaborators Donald Glover has had many collaborators throughout his career. Musically, one of his right-hand men being Ludwig Göransson, who has helped produce pretty much all of his albums in his career, even as far back as Camp. They met on the set community where Ludwig was actually producing the soundtrack for the show. Ludwig would actually feature on Childish Gambino's live band as well, where he would more prominently play the guitar. And there's even videos on YouTube of him creating the guitar solo on songs like The Worst Guys. Outside of working with Gambino, Ludwig has actually worked on many film soundtracks, most notably being Black Panther, Creed, Tenet, The Mandalorian, just to name a few. And he has won some many Academy Awards, and yeah, this man is crazy talented. One of his main collaborators on the filmmaking and music video side is Hiro Murai. When it comes to video production, Hiro Murai has it pretty much helped Gambino even as far back as 3005 in Sweatpants music videos. He's even responsible for filming This Is America. He's also been a director on Guava Island and the TV show Atlanta. And he has a very successful career. So yeah, Donald is very great at picking out talent, that's very apparent. By the way, shoutouts to Gambino's live band. A lot of those members have been playing in his band since camp. And you'll notice a lot of familiar faces if you see him perform recently. Some of the same people have been on previous tours as well. Lair 4. Stone Mountain and Kauai. Stone Mountain and Kauai was a mixtape EP released in 2014. The Stone Mountain mixtape consists of songs that sample a lot of DJ Gangster Grills tracks, and it's mainly Donald giving his own spin on these already existing tracks. Obviously this part of the project is considered a mixtape. It's basically pretty much well-known tracks that have samples that obviously can't be cleared. The other half of the project being the Kwai EP is probably the side more people are familiar with as it has a lot of popular songs off of it, the most notable one being Sober. The Kwai EP is all original Gambino content and the songs have a summery beachside tropical feel to them. The project as a whole is pretty alright. The Kawaii EP is probably more refined and you can actually listen to it on Spotify because the Stone Mountain mixtape, being a mixtape, you're probably going to only find it on YouTube and other websites. I wouldn't say it's Gambino's best material of all time, but although there are some clear high points, check out the Stone Mountain mixtape if you didn't even know it existed because it's not on Spotify, so maybe some people actually don't know it's out there, but it is. One interesting thing to bring up about this project is it has a secret track, but I'll bring that up later in the iceberg. MC DJ, this was Donald Glover's early alias when he was DJing in college and even a little bit after college as well. He DJed and remixed multiple projects like Illinois and even the Charlie Brown Christmas. He would later transition out of DJing for projects and would transition to more Childish Gambino stuff later in his career. If you really like Gambino though, then definitely search up MC DJ. The Royalty Mixtape was released in 2012, a year before BTI. This would be Gambino's introduction to joining the royalty group, which would be a close group of friends in Gambino's circle that would help try to make their careers better. The royalty collective would include his brother, who was also a rapper and even a writer on Atlanta. When it comes to the mixtape itself, the mixtape is the first debut of Chance the Rapper and Gambino on a song together, and even a lot of features on this project including RZA, Danny Brown, and Schoolboy Q, just to name a few. This project is beloved by a lot of hardcore Gambino fans, but a lot of the people who have no idea this even exists because it's a mixtape and it's not on streaming services. As far as the collective, they are still working together as royalty, and even the collective is more of a close-knit of people in Gambino's circle for his projects, whether it's technical directors or management. Alpha Dog, The Regular Show. So if you wanted Childish Gambino and Tyler the Creator to be on a song together, well, here it is. Yes, on The Regular Show. Tyler the Creator and Donald Glover are on the regular show and they're rapping, it's pretty funny, it's a nice cameo if you're into them. Uh, the character Donald is playing is Alpha Dog. Early 2010s tours. 
The early 2010s were definitely an interesting period in Gambino's career. These performances are pretty hard to find on the internet these days, but these performances are known to be much more intimate because Gambino's fan base was a lot smaller at the time. But it's nice to look back and see how hype he would get even all the way back then. It's fun to definitely view some of these early performances, and you can see some of the cast and community members in the background of some of the performances. Muppets and Sesame Street appearance. Donald Glover actually makes cameos in both the Muppets movie released in early 2011 and even Sesame Street. There are a lot of small cameos that Gambino has here and there, but in Sesame Street, Gambino plays a musician called LMNOP, so yeah, definitely check those out if you're interested. The BTI screenplay and The Boy. So I stated earlier in the iceberg that I would discuss The Boy, so here it is. The Boy is a character and the protagonist of the BTI screenplay. The interesting thing behind the character is The Boy basically became an extension of Gambino himself as he would dress as the boy in pretty much every single interview during the BTI era. Notice the clothing when he wears the same hat, the same coat, the same shirt, the same pants in every interview that he did during this time period. It's because he's playing a version of the boy when he does these interviews. The boy is a very existential character where even in the screenplay and a lot of the connections to the boy cover a lot of things that Gambino was actually going through in his life. In the screenplay, the boy meets a girl named Naomi, which is a reference to Janae Ayako, which is someone Gambino actually was romantically involved with at the time. In the screenplay, the boy perceives Naomi as being a savior in a way, but he later learns throughout the screenplay that he can't use a girl to fill the holes for himself of him lacking things as a person. It's definitely a way for the boy to express things that Gambino was actually going through in aspects of his life during this time period. But one of the themes of BTI being it's hard to tell what if something is real or if something is not real in the internet world. And why maybe certain things in the BTI screenplay are there for purely theatrics as it is the internet. It's hard to tell what's real and what's a lie. Hell that's even a lyric that's straight off the album. At the end of the screenplay the boy is killed by a drug deal gone wrong, almost similar to the death of Gatsby from the Great Gatsby book. The boy's death is even shown off in one of the advertisements for BTI where Gambino is laying motionless in a pool. Despite his death in the screenplay, some speculate that aspects of the EP Kawhi relate towards the character The Boy. Gambino decided to dress the same for a multitude of interviews during this time period as well, making some people speculate that he was dressing as The Boy on purpose. But again, part of the meaning behind BTI and the screenplay being is it's about the internet. It's hard to tell what's real, what's not. If you want a more deep dive explanation of the screenplay itself, you can actually read it online. And some versions of the BTI vinyl actually include the screenplay in the vinyl. So you can actually listen to the album and read the screenplay at the same time. That's how Gambino wanted it to be done, but it's up to you how you want to do it. Unreleased songs. So just like any artist, you're going to have unreleased music. And there are actually a few songs that are pretty prominent in the community. The most prominent one being Human Sacrifice. This track was shown off multiple times live, and during the This Is America tour in 2018, this track's instrumental was teased in multiple commercials relating to the tour and other Gambino advertisements. Still, however, this song never even came out in 3.15.20. Instead, there was a version of the track that only had the intro to the song. So basically, as if Gambino is teasing this song, knowing this song is out there, but not really giving us the full song at the same time. To this day, we don't have the finished version to this track. Gambino has stated in some live performances that he thought about not even releasing the song officially. I don't know if that's him trolling or being real or not, but that's what he said. Maybe one day we'll see the light of day for this song though. So profound. He also performed this song during freestyles during the BTI era, where he would recreate the beat and then rap over it. This song was most likely created during the BTI era. It was performed in a handful of times during this era as well. It has a pretty insane Gambino verse on it. There's most likely a version of the song officially recorded out there as it was performed live in even 2014 in some DJ sets. This song is basically a grail in the Gambino community and I don't think it's ever going to see the light of day because, well, it was made all the way back in the BTI era. Maybe it will leak one day, who knows. There are a bunch of songs that were made for Guava Island as well, but they haven't seen the light of day. The most prominent one being Saturday. 
Saturday made its first debut in Gambino's SNL performance in 2018. Then it was shown off in sort of a high quality form in Guava Island during the climax of the film. And then he would perform the song during a handful of live shows during this time period for the This Is America tour. This song is probably one of the most favorite unreleased songs out there. It's actually a really charming song. Almanac. The Almanac is actually a name Gambino uses whenever he's making a new album. In fact, the original name for 31520's project was actually called The Almanac. A bunch of songs that landed on 31520 were originally supposed to be on this supposed Almanac album. There are a couple leaks out there for Gambino songs that were supposed to be on this project. There are snippets and some leaked tracks out there, but either they're not completely finished or fleshed out or the leaks haven't been bought out yet. Although there are a few Gambino leaks out there, I will leave that for the unreleased songs, but for now, I could just be talking about every single leak snippet and we'd be here forever. There are definitely some unreleased Gambino stuff out there though. Uh, I'll leave it later in the iceberg, so stay tuned for that part. There are plenty of alternate versions of songs out there. The Night Me and Your Mama Met with lyrics is one of them. The version of the song was only performed live and it was given to people who bought the limited edition vinyl where you could view the performance on the Pharos app. Although it's been archived on the internet now. Another alternate track that treads into the unreleased leak territory is the Feels Like Summer with Travis Scott. This version of the song features Travis Scott singing the hook and the chorus of the song and it kind of gives it a completely different vibe to the track. This is America featuring Slim from Ray Shremid. This America was actually called Capitalism at one point, and it doesn't surprise me that this song had features at one point, especially from Ray Shremid, as Gambino has toured with Ray Shremid during the This Is America tour. But this version of the song actually has features and different lyrics on it, so it's definitely a much rougher and early production to the song. Not surprising for a leak, but it's interesting to think that this is what the song was at one point. The song Warlords featuring Kid Cudi. Warlords was first shown off in a couple live performances where people were probably clueless on what Gambino was saying on this song. The song wouldn't actually drop until 3.15.20 came out, and the feature originally was supposed to be Kid Cudi. There's multiple versions of this Warlords track in much earlier forms, but obviously Kid Cudi didn't make it on the final version of the song. Pharos. Now there's actually a lot that meets the eye when it comes to Pharos. Pharos was a logo that was first shown off and Donald Glover was developing some sort of app. But people had no idea what this app actually was. What this Pharos thing was even going to be. Some people thought Pharos was the name of Gambino's next project, even as far back in 2015. Then in 2016, Gambino would announce that Pharos would be a solo Gambino concert where people could sign up for the concert through the app for some sort of Woodstock-like experience and potential even being able to hear new songs off of his next project. In reality, Pharaohs 2016 was the first unveiling of Awaken My Love as surprise for the audience. Gambino was playing 100% new music the entire time during the concert, and the interesting thing is the event had no phones allowed, so you could basically have to put your phones in concealed cases the entire time and know it could leak out the music. But despite these rules, this didn't stop fans from literally putting a microphone in their crotch and recording the entire performance. So yeah, you can actually hear the first look of Awaken My Love on YouTube, which didn't come out for a few more months. And listening to this performance through basically somebody's crotch area. Actually, the audio quality is pretty good and you can actually listen to the performance to this day. And it's people's literal first reactions to hearing the album. Gambino and his band performed with some literal tribal gear on and some neon lights and some VR graphics made by Microsoft that would play around the dome of the ceiling. Some interesting things to note is the first time in performing Awaken My Love you can hear some production differences in these very early versions of the songs. Judging by the impressions in the crowd that night, the most interesting song for everybody was California. Which, instead of being mostly autotune like it is in the final version, Gambino is actually singing the song without any autotune. Which surprisingly had a more positive reaction compared to the studio version of the song where people consider it to be one of the weaker songs on Awaken My Love. Terrified had a longer instrumental break in the song that isn't present on the album. The Night Me and Your Mama Met had lyrics instead of just being an instrumental. 
Boogeyman has a verse of him rapping, which he normally only does in live performances. Stan Tall has production differences that are different in the live version. And he even covers a song called Hit It and Quit It from Funkadelic's Maggot Brain, which was a big inspiration to Awaken My Love. All in all, if you want to hear the microphone crotch recorded to early Awaken My Love, you know, it's still out there on YouTube. It's actually surprisingly good compared to, you know, where it's actually being recorded from. Now, you thought I was done talking about Pharos, but there was actually another Pharos in 2018, this time being performed in New Zealand. Now, unfortunately, this concert did have some issues because it was ended up raining pretty badly and the experience was bad for some of the people that went. Some people did go to this Pharos thinking it was going to have an entire album to perform, just like the Pharos in 2016, but unfortunately, people were disappointed that the setlist was mainly the same setlist for the This Is America tour at the time. But there were a few new songs that people were yet to hear, being an early version of Warlords, which would debut on 3 There was a couple new songs that Gambino would play, but only Algorithm would be officially released. The Pharos app later up being used for people who can view some of the performances from the 2016 performance of Pharos. But aside from that, the Pharos app was really only used for hardcore fans to view the performances through the app if you had the limited edition Awaken My Love vinyl, which I do have. Janae Ayako. Gambino met Janae around the BTI era, where she is referred many times throughout the screenplay being Naomi. She is featured on a song on BTI being Pink Toes, and Gambino would later feature on her own song called Bed Piece, which the whole video is supposed to be a reference to John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Gambino and Janae has stated multiple times that they were only friends and they were not romantically involved, but Honestly, I'm calling that cap. I mean, come on, look at these pictures. Do you, you think you're fooling me, Gambino? Although they definitely aren't together anymore, Gambino references Janae a lot during BTI, and she's even featured in the video Telegraph Avenue. And even the final track for BTI, Gambino is pretty much talking about Janae, especially on the song Life of the Biggest Troll, where he states she texts me, how are you going to trust somebody when you don't even trust yourself? She says she feel alone all the time, I'm similar. I meet her in the dreams, on the moon I visit her. And then at the very end of the song it seems like it's an existential chant to that how he needs her and he needs her to help him and where he pleads, please help me, please help me. To conclude with some lesson Gambino probably learned during this era in an interview in April 2014 on Studio Q. But that's the thing, like I learned last year the most important thing and that is like you know, the only love that's reciprocal is love of self. You really have to like yourself. That's the thing. And that's the only thing. You can't rely on other people. That's whack. It's so whack to be like, please fill in these holes in me that, like, I don't think I'm strong enough. Like, that's whack. Like, you gotta like yourself enough to be like, no, this idea is cool and I like it. What enough. happened to She Completes Me? Oh, that, that's stupid. <laughs> that's dumb. To be like, oh, she's complete, or like, this person completes me. It's like, no, he's, that person's a really good friend. Sometimes I have sex with them. It's great, but they are on this journey with me, and if they left, it'd be okay. Wow. You have to do that to yourself. Otherwise, you're just wasting money. Yeah. Which seems entirely to contradict what Gambino was writing on The Life of the Biggest Troll, but that means he learned some sort of lesson during this time period, and that you don't need people to complete you. And I find that to be a great lesson, so moving on. The live version of Riot being way longer and more fleshed out. Also Gambino dedicating a performance of Riot to Mac Miller. During multiple performances during the This is America tour, Gambino actually played a much longer and more fleshed out version of the song Riot, and he takes the song that was originally only a few minutes long and extends it to five minutes. Having the beginning be more somber and tranquil, while the half transition of the song being a pretty epic beat climax to the song. This is probably one of my personal favorite Gambino songs to see live as he goes pretty ham during the performance. Before the song reaches the climax, he actually tells the crowd a little bit about himself and talks to them, you know, about whatever's on his mind during the, whatever tour he's at. During the 2018 Chicago performance, the late Mac Miller would recently pass away, and Gambino told the crowd that he was dedicating this performance to Mac Miller. Like, I, my, my heart was broken. Like, I'm 
Like, like if you guys knew him, I wish, and, and, I, and I feel good about being sad, because like, I, it, 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 it tells me that he was special, that I had a special moment. You know what I'm saying? Everybody deserves that. Everybody in this room, you don't have to take a picture. You're, and everybody in this room, you are nobody's narrative. You know, sometimes people struggle with that because people will tell you who you are on the internet. You're the corny ass white dude, you're the corny black kid. You're the weirdo, you're the this, you're the that. You're the smarty art black girl, you're the, you know, they, they will, they'll make a narrative about you. But we're all way too complex to be a narrative. So I just want to say I love you, Mac. And I just want to tell you guys I love you and that this song is, this song is for him. And later stated that Mac Miller meant a lot to him and he stated how much talent he had and how he was really loved music in general. It's a nice performance. Donald Glover's Three Sons and Significant Other Donald Glover actually has three sons and a significant other. Donald's significant other being Michelle White, as they've been seen together all the way back in 2015. He mainly keeps his life under wraps, so if you want to figure this stuff out, you can probably figure it out through Google searching. His relationship with Michelle is pretty under wraps because Gambino just likes it to be that way. His first son being born in 2016, and a large portion of the album Awaken My Love is being dedicated to his son, Legend Glover. His next son being Drake Glover, and his final son being Donald Glover III, most likely being named this way because his father recently passed away who was also Donald Glover as well. You can find pictures online of Gambino, Donald Glover with his family, but he keeps his life under wraps and honestly I respect that, but not even people found out he had a third son until he randomly dropped it in an interview that he had a third son. Donald Glover was Teddy Perkins in Atlanta. Teddy Perkins was a character that only appeared in one episode in the show Atlanta. The character is a pretty dark take on people like Michael Jackson and where they end up were being extremely talented and then they end up having a lot of personal demons and abusive people in their life that push them to this really talented place in their life. How at the end they make a star but they end up getting abused a lot in the process. It's a pretty dark episode, I'm not going to spoil any of it because I would say it's probably one of the best episodes in the show. Lakeith Stanfield has a great performance in this episode, and people want to know who Teddy Perkins was because in the end credits it just says Teddy Perkins was playing himself. Well actually the person playing Teddy was actually Donald Glover himself in a heavy amount of makeup, and while doing a pretty convincing voice change as well in order to hide that it was really Donald Glover the whole time. So yeah, watch the episode, by the way. It's a really amazing episode in the show. Layer 5. Cancel Deadpool series. So before Fox was bought out by Disney, they were outsourcing the television networks to certain Marvel characters that Fox had the rights for. One of the TV networks being FX. And because Don Glover is close with FX and because they've worked on Atlanta, he was allowed to make a Deadpool series that was probably never going to see the light of day. The reason why it won't see the light of day is because Fox was bought out by Disney and then the rights of Deadpool went back to Marvel and Disney. Meaning this show that Donald wrote for an entire season 4 got cancelled. So when it got cancelled Donald posted the entire script online and you can actually read it on the internet to this day, it's only a google search away. 31520 original titles. So if you remember I stated earlier the titles on 31520 are all the timestamps meaning they don't have original titles. Well actually people found out by looking in the metadata for some of the sites out there and physical tracks, they actually found the actual names for each songs and they were originally supposed to have actual names before they were just changed to where they were on the track list. Black Panther Special Thanks Donald Glover actually gets a special thanks in the credits of the Black Panther movie. It's actually because Donald and his brother Steve were responsible for punching up the script on some of the jokes in the film which is why Donald gets a thank you at the end of the credits. Finding his clothes online. There's quite a large effort online of trying to find Gambino's clothing that he actually wears in interviews and in public. A lot of BTI clothing he wears is straight up not in print anymore. There are some knockoff sellers out there, but the original clothing is straight up just not around anymore. There is a big effort online to find the exact brands and the clothing that he wears, but not gonna lie, some of this stuff he's wearing is really expensive. <laughs> Uh, so it's not like y'all are going to be affording it anyways. <laughs> XXS BF Cute Star XX. 
This is actually one of the alt accounts Donald Glover himself has on YouTube. He used this account to upload scenes from Camp, the album that he was recording back in the day. Why is it XX? BF cute star XX I have no idea don't ask me Donald has a lot of weird alter accounts and we'll go over another one the Japanese tumblr account this is a tumblr account now abandoned from a Japanese girl where she would post things related to Japanese culture and childish Gambino wow I didn't know people in Japan actually cared about childish Gambino but okay I'm I'm you there's a Japanese girl she really likes Donald Glover whatever okay well, it turns out that this Japanese girl was actually Donald Glover LARPing as an Asian girl on Tumblr. I have no idea why. It is it is real though. It's out there. Uh, you really can't find it anymore. The Tumblr account was taken down. With the Wayback Machine, you can see the old posts and stuff like that. He really loves Asian women, especially in his early career, so, you know, he would say it all the time on his songs. This Japanese Tumblr account would even post early versions of pre-Camp Gambino songs like L.E.S., which is partly how people found out this was him. Why he did this, I have no idea, but moving on. The Royalty Spiritual Awakening. Donald Glover read this book all the way back in the BTI era, and it's actually by Yafet Kodo, which the name of a single that also dropped in the BTI era as well. Obviously, this person is incredibly important in Gambino's development and must have been an inspiration to him. Here's what the back of the book says. The royalty contains the exquisite imagery and psychological descriptions of mystic experiences. This book gives you not only many beautiful and inspiring illustrations that bring you an awakening of inner powers and awareness, but it also gives you scientific reasoning for self-realization through the power of thought and willing and feelings. It reveals an ancient spiritual technique revealed millennia ago through the scriptures of the prophets and the secret Kyria. An instrument through human evolution can be quickened. The book is pretty hard to find in a physical format, but if you want to read the book, it has inspired a lot of Gambino's development throughout the years, so check it out if you're a huge Gambino fan. The original name for Awaken My Love was actually Operation High Jump. Yes, you heard it right. The original name for Childish Gambino's album in 2016 was actually based off of a U.S. Navy Arctic program in 1946. I don't know why he chose this as the original name. Donald has been known to chose random stuff for temp albums and stuff like that. But yes, this name actually got very far in development. Uh, your guess is as good as mine and why they chose Operation High Jump. I think Awaken My Love is way better, which is why they obviously went with that title instead. How I found out this was legit was pretty late in development because Festival Love Box in 2018 was actually selling merch for Operation High Jump posters, showing that this idea must have been pretty far in development uh, before they probably changed the name. But there are posters of Operation High Jump and them testing out different fonts for that name, Operation High Jump. 3005 started as a Drake beat. Yes, it's not a joke. The original chorus used on 3005, the I'll be right by your side till 3005, that part actually came from Gambino rapping over Drake's tracks called Trophies. This recreation has been actually made by the Dissect Podcast, so shout out to them. Check out their recreation of what this probably sounded like. Gambino wasn't actually on the track Trophies, he was just kind of messing around and rapping over the beat, and that's how he made that chorus. So this was definitely the original seed for the 3005 song. Gambino's earlier projects. Donald actually has a multitude of early projects in his career in music. Outside of his main albums, he had an EP, just titled EP, that was released in 2011. A multitude of mixtapes. Point Dexter, released in 2009. I Am Just a Rapper, 1 and 2. Cul-de-sac, all released in 2010. Sick Boy, released in 2008. And that's pretty much all I'm going to say because honestly, some of these really, really early Gambino albums are pretty much forgotten or really not that good in my opinion. However, his first mixtape, The Younger I Get, released in 2005 where he would physically hand out this mixtape to people, yes. This project has never been available digitally and Gambino himself has come out and said he doesn't associate with this project anymore. But this mixtape is still sort of a grail in the community because it's probably so early and bad that Gambino fans just want to hear it. Donald himself has stated he pretty much disowns this project though, and it was overly personal for being a project in general. Even though it was only released on a CD, people still want to find this project, so maybe someday I guess. Yefit Kodo was originally meant to be on Because the Internet. 
Yes, the song Yafet Koto that was released as a single during the BTI era was actually originally meant to be on the album, but it was declined because the sample could not be cleared. This is actually backed up because the song is used in a lot of promotional material, it's mentioned during the screenplay. However, the song uses a sample that they couldn't clear, so Gambino took it off the album and just released it as a solo single track. And that's also why it's not on Spotify to this day. Donald Glover wearing... Donald being awkward on The Breakfast Club with Charlemagne. Donald has been on The Breakfast Club, which is a morning radio interview show, one of the hosts being Charlemagne. And Donald Glover and Charlemagne feel like they have a lot of awkward tension between each other. Donald Glover is always more reserved, but Charlemagne, well, being Charlemagne, doesn't really seem like he's the biggest Gambino fan, and he's always testing him and just being Charlemagne, which is pretty normal. Gambino misunderstood the situation after one of the interviews and thought Charlemagne gave him Donkey of the Day for rapping during a freestyle saying he was one of the best rappers out there. This led to, well... Whatever you want. <laughs> what, is it awkward? I'm having a great time, man. I am too. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just a little... Smell do y'all really feel Stop me? Stop it, man. Like, do you smell what I'm cooking? Like, we do. For real? Well, I'm going to say, real? no, but Childish Gambino, you really hurt Charlemagne's feelings. You, you I just, hurt. He was upset. It did not hurt my feelings. He dissed him in a record. I just, he was felt mad. like. He was like, I didn't give a fuck. He's trying to act up, but point? his feelings were hurt. If, I didn't diss him. If I, if, 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 if. First of all, I said Charlemagne's. I don't even care about that. I was like, St. Carl. It's a whole bunch of you. You're a smart guy. A whole bunch of you. And you're a smart guy, but it's like, yo, he must have misunderstood me. I never gave him Donkey today. Like, I saw you say in an interview, he gave me Donkey today. I never gave you Donkey today. Charlemagne, I need he you. He said he didn't. He I, I need okay. you. Like, for real. Like, you got, like, you're important. Like, you, I want that discussion to go on. You don't need me. You need deodorant. No, nah, I do I, like don't that. Need me. Okay. I need you to hate me so I can buy the odor. I don't hate you, though. All right. <laughs> I don't hate you. All right. That is not a hateful statement. Donald Glover on The Lazarus Effect and Magic Mike and The Martian. Donald Glover actually appears in a lot of movies around the 2010s, one of them being 2015's Lazarus Effect, and this movie is not good and I haven't watched it, it has a 16% on Rotten Tomatoes, and I'll probably never watch it, but just know that Donald Glover dies in the movie, he gets shoved into a locker and dies. He's also on Magic Mike XXL, and no, I didn't watch this movie either, so I'm sorry, but, you know, he, he does play a sort of deep healer dancer guy where he basically is kind of playing himself in a way but uh, whatever anyways and lastly you might have saw him in the martian which is probably one of the roles he's better known for i would say uh, he has a nice little side role in this movie and it's actually not bad so definitely check it out gambino song in creed so i mentioned earlier that one of gambino's collaborators ludwig Göransson, actually made the soundtrack to creed so because that, we actually got a song called Waiting For Your Moment that actually features Janae, Vince Staples, and Gambino on a single track. And the song was released in 2015, and it actually uh, has a really good uh, vocal performance from Gambino, where he's kind of flexing his early Awaken My Love vocals a year early from when that album would come out. Clapping for the wrong reasons. This was a film created during the BTI era that was created when Gambino was just living in an empty penthouse with a bunch of friends. But from the tone of the film, it's played off as the main character, the boy, being lonely and not really connecting with anyone. There are actually some snippets of unreleased tracks here. Chance the Rapper is also in the documentary. An actual porn star makes an appearance and Gambino asks her, Why are you here? But she just doesn't answer him. It's a really deep film, you're supposed to dig into the meaning for it about being alone and lacking direction. A lot of the themes in the BTI screenplay are present in this film. And it's actually filmed by Hiro Mirai, so yeah, you can also view it on YouTube right now, you can search it up, it's up there, so check it out. Donald in the cast of Best Coast Ordeal. Okay, so yeah, this is kind of a more lower budget film made by Drew Barrymore, but Donald Glover plays a day trotter, which is one of the gangs in the film. This is kind of like a film music video thing, very similar to Grease, if you've seen that movie. He doesn't really have a large role in the film, but he's kind of just there. I don't really think people even know this thing exists, this music video film thing. Or people probably don't even know he's in it, but I somehow found out. So yeah, he is in here, he's in the director's commentary as well, talking about the movie. So yeah, it's definitely one of the more underknown Gambino things that he's even in this. Donald Glover doing a PSA for Rashida Jones. Donald Glover actually voiced the anti-harassment PSA that was written and created by Rashida Jones. And so yeah, you can actually watch this on YouTube. You hear his voice. As the current wave of sexual allegations left you scared, confused, 
maybe even a little angry. Is the culture shifting under your feet so fast you can't make sense of it? Or do you simply not know how to behave at work anymore? Fear not, you are frequently asked questions about sexual harassment. It's a little ironic because Gambino straight up calls her out by name on the track Not Going Back, where he states, Ran into Rashida Jones, told me that she heard my song. When I called her mixed like the crowd at my last show, she said to write her something nice on the next track. But she cute so I wrote her ass a whole rap. Man, I threw that shit away, it felt dumb. Believe me, it was bad, we're better off, you're welcome. I worked hard on that song like day and night. That whole song made that one verse crazy, right? But that isn't the only occasion of Donald straight up calling her out on a song as even on the track on Cul-de-Sac, he subtly mentions her on the track as well. It's safe to say that Gambino probably had a crush on her uh, in his younger years. And oh yeah, they're also in the Muppet movie together. So yeah, that's kind of funny as well. Layer 6. Alright, this is where it starts getting good. Unreleased, scrapped, Chance the Rapper, and Gambino project. So probably the most hardcore Gambino and Chance stands will remember this, but Donald Glover and Chance have been teasing this project for years. I mean, literally he called out Chance during one of the times he was accepting an award and said he wanted to do a project with him. Um, also, if I feel like if I don't make a Chance the Rapper mixtape, like double mixtape, a bunch of 14 year olds are gonna kick my ass. So I, they stop me on the street and it's kind of scary. Youth scares me. So I, I feel like I got to do something. I probably will. And But they never did. Fun fact, I went to see Gambino live at the This Is America tour in Chicago, which is where Chance lives and I live in the same area as well. I was literally 20 feet from Chance the Rapper, who was also in the crowd in a gated celebrity area of the crowd. But yeah, you could say I like almost met him in a way. But anyways, the Chance and Gambino bromance goes all the way back to when Chance the Rapper was just getting started in his career, where Gambino would allow Chance to open for Gambino all the way back in the day. Then they would be featured on each other's projects, most notably being BTI's The Worst Guys. This would also begin years, and I mean years, where Gambino and Chance would say that they were going to work on a project together, starting all the way back in 2014. As the years came by and Gambino and Chance became more developed as artists and the chance, pun intended, of the project ever coming out, slowly dwindling. But at seemingly random occurrences, they would reveal that they were working on the project together at like really random times. Like for example, like I brought up earlier at the Emmys 2017, Donald literally saying that he wanted to drop a Chance and Gambino project before he dies. Then Chance, the rapper, plays a snippet of Donald and Chance on the same track, then silence for many years after that. And then of course Chance would drop, you know, the big shit in 2019 and that would seemingly be the project that hasn't been talked about since. Me and Donald have more songs together. So does Chance and Gambino even have a project out there? Or is it just DJ Khaled would say some mysterious music? Or is it some vaporware? Is it actually being worked on or no? Well, actually something interesting to bring up is there actually is a leak of one of the tracks that was supposedly on this project. It's only 10 to 15 seconds long, but it's actually pretty fire with some pretty interesting gospel inspiration on it. It reminds me of something like on The Life of Pablo, kind of similar instrumentation. But yeah, Chance and Gambino are on a song together, they were making a joint project, but seemingly it is in development hell, and they probably will always be in development hell. And if you've seen the news lately, you would know that Chance the Rapper and his manager, well, it seems like Chance isn't really the nicest guy after all, so maybe the chances of, you see what I did there, dropping a project after all the controversy maybe is at its lowest than it's ever been before. But hey, at least we get some form of it out there. If it isn't some sort of lie, it's probably some sort of project out there that's never going to see the light of day. Chance the Rapper's Parallels to Clark County from Atlanta. So this is more conspiracy theory territory, or maybe it's just a coincidence, but some people believe the character Clark County from Donald Glover's show Atlanta is a parallel to the real life Chance the Rapper. You see why I put these right next to each other? Anyways, so what are the similarities you ask? They both star in commercials where they make raps for brands and then they make catchy tunes for these brands that end up in commercials. Showing that they're making a lot of money in the industry 
at the highest form making commercials for brands. And the show Clark County is doing it for the song Yoohoo, which is chocolate milk. And it's pretty catchy that this is, you know, in the show. Now the real life parallel to this being Chance the Rapper's Kit Kat commercial, which is very prominent in the highest heights of Chance's career having all these commercials with all these brands. So the next similarity is the public personas being pretty similar to each other. Clark County is shown to be dancing in corporate meetings with other companies, which Paperboy in the show is seen very uncomfortable with the thought of dancing and performing with a room full of fake white people. They also make it clear that Clark County wears a public persona around these corporate people where they see him as being overly friendly and being fake nice in order to benefit his career. Then later in the show it's shown that Clark County is not really as nice as he seems off to be initially with these small groups of people where he actually is seen threatening to beat the shit out of one of the producers for accidentally crashing one of the programs that they were using to make a song with. And the irony here is that you can't really control when a program crashes, so in a way this could be a smart way of telling us these chance the rapper and manager beefs that, you know, that has been going on for the past couple months in a really smart way. So basically people speculate that Clark is clearly the same character made to parody Chance the Rapper. And since Gambino has known Chance for a really long time, maybe he was putting a little bit of his own real life experiences with the guy in sort of a, you know, make-believe character. But again, it's only a conspiracy theory. Take it for what it is. At the end of the day, Clark County is made to be one of the most profitable people in the music industry. While also being a complete asshole because of the fame, it's probably pretty common in the music industry anyways. Predicting Justin Bieber's justice in Atlanta. So this is a more recent development, but in a way, Donald Glover predicted Justin Bieber's justice song that came out in 2021. In an episode of Atlanta, they make a parody version of Justin Bieber, literally called Justin Bieber. And Justin in Atlanta gets in trouble with the press and the scandal is created where the news wants to interview him. So what happens in the show is Justin comes out and apologizes for what happens and then he states that he has a new album coming out and the new hit song being Justice and you can hear it now. And funny fact is this song is actually sung by Gambino himself. Uh, but this is really just a play on how celebrities make money from controversy. And then when Justin actually came out and made an album called Justice recently, people asked Donald on Twitter if he is a prophet and he predicts the future. And he simply responded before deleting this tweet, The world is just predictable. Me and Your Mama's first live performance in Bonnaroo 2015. So the first ever live performance of Me and Your Mama which came out officially at the end of 2016. It was actually performed a year earlier in the summer of 2015. People had no idea what this song was. The recording is still on the internet. It's mostly known for this dude yelling at the beginning. There are production differences to the song. It's definitely in a earlier live performance of the song, so it's not completely finished. But now why did Gambino perform this song in 2015, you ask? Well, actually, a little bit later in the iceberg, I will state how Me and Your Mama was actually on a scrapped album. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But yeah, this performance is still on YouTube. You can still find it. I can't play the song because, you know, copyright claims. But the Google search is, you know, just a Google search away. So it's out there. Telegraph Ave is about a real person. So this song in general has a lot of history about it. First off, it leaked from Michael B. Jordan himself on Twitter. Gambino asked him to leak it. Why, I have no idea. Probably because it's random for Michael B. Jordan to just have this song. But he did just do that, and Gambino's label was pretty upset about it and started listing out DMCA takedowns for anyone who posted the song. Also, the original version of the song didn't have the Lloyd sample at the beginning. That was a late addition to the song. Lloyd actually passed on being on the track 3005, so Gambino asked him if he would do Telegraph Avenue instead, and he agreed. So Gambino asked him to sing the song and then he made it into a sample which is part of the song. Really trippy and weird but that's how it's done. The song is actually about a girl that Gambino used to date and that's why it's named Telegraph Avenue because the real life location they used to meet up in in Oakland where Gambino would drive all the way from LA to see her. The early unreleased cut of the Sweatpants music video. Before Hiro Mirai would work with Childish Gambino on the Sweatpants music video, 
they actually recorded another version of the sweatpants music video with a different director at a different diner. Yes, there's barely any footage for this, but I think this early version will probably never see the light of day, but it is out there. We only have like a sneak peek preview of what this could have been, but most likely it got reworked because Gambino wasn't satisfied with it, and he did choose a different director, which was Hiro Mirai, to direct this new version of Sweatpants. It does seem like a lot of the ideas made it into the final video are still present in the early video, like everyone in the video is starting to become Gambino, but it's still an early version of this, and Hero was not directing this version, so maybe there were some small changes here and there. But yeah, it's pretty hard to find any footage of this, but there is a couple clips out there. The whole video will probably never see the light of day. Donald will grab your phone during World Star. So this is pretty well known if you go to Gambino live concerts, but anyways, World Star specifically, he will call out people in the crowd for not recording sideways, and sometimes he will actually physically fix it for you. It's, it's a little meta thing behind the track World Star in general, but sometimes he'll grab people's phones, and every now and then you'll see a funny clip of like someone getting their phone grabbed or Gambino making their phone go sideways. <laughs> it's pretty funny. 28. Okay, I know I teased this one earlier, but yeah, I did a little bit of a meme on you. If you're in the Gambino community, the number 28 probably gives you some mild PTSD because for some reason, during shows on the This America era, Gambino's crew would shine the number 28 during shows, and this got people speculating hard. Oh my god, what does this number mean? What does 28 mean? Why is it being shown during all these live shows for no reason? Is this the day the new album's coming out on a 28th of some month? 28 means absolutely nothing. The number 28 could have been really anything, but it, it's, it's not anything. It could have been Gambino's bat signal. It could have been just a test number for the lights or something, but people just wanted to speculate for days about what this number was. There's literally pages of conspiracy theories on Reddit of what 28 was. It's just a stupid number. It means nothing. To this day, we don't have an answer to what 28 is. It's nothing. Move on. That's what 28 was. Oh wait, oh wait, I know the Gambino loyalists are going to try to shoot me. In the track 1238, Gambino says, and I quote, 45, I'll 28 that ass. I have no idea what that means, but if we're going to chalk it up to anything for the 28 meme, maybe it just was a lead up to this verse on this track. I, I have no idea. Well, it means nothing. Move on. Gambino had an entire album that was scrapped before Awaken My Love. I'm surprised this isn't talked about more in the Gambino community, but in an interview, he actually literally states that he scrapped an entire album that came before Awaken My Love, which is why it took two to three years to make Awaken My Love, because he scrapped an entire album during that period. Now it's unknown if this project sounded like Awaken My Love at all, or if it did or didn't. We do have potential demos of smaller songs that were released during this potential time period, but no song is really confirmed to be on this album except Me and Your Mama. And Gambino says this himself, that it was the only surviving song, which was Me and Your Mama, which guided Gambino to make Awaken My Love. Saying how Me and Your Mama became the heart of Awaken My Love and guided them to make the entire album. This is maybe why it was performed in 2015, because Me and Your Mama was probably one of the first finished tracks in some form, but it was previously on another project in an earlier point. The Stone Mountain version of 3005, aka the BTI secret track in the screenplay. So this is definitely a more hardcore Gambino fan type information here, but on the Stone Mountain and Kauai mixtape EP, the final song on the project is simply a beachside style remix of 3005 and it's only an instrumental. It doesn't contain any lyrics. Also in the BTI screenplay near the end of the screenplay it mentions that you can play a secret track. While no one was able to figure out what the secret track was or they had any idea what it was, the mystery wouldn't be solved for another two years. It took a giant fan effort from the entire Donald Glover Reddit to try and find this mysterious supposed track. Well, one day on our Donald Glover, a user randomly came out and stated that if they looked at the script for Because the Internet on the internet version of the site, some Eagle Eye fans looked in this coding for the site and they basically were able to figure out a way to unlock lyrics for this track that no one had any idea it existed. 
So the man who said learn to code is now rewarding his fans who knew how to code. So on the lyrics, Gambino mentions 3005, so people were able to figure out that, hey, there's no lyrics on the 3005 Beach Picnic version, so boom, they fit perfectly together. And a previously empty song with no lyrics now does have lyrics, showing that people were willing to crack the code and put in the work, and they were rewarded a full song. Gambino later proved it on Twitter saying that they cracked the code and the song was the secret track mentioned in the screenplay, congratulating the people who found out. Now some people speculate and have conspiracy theories on the person who found the code. Some people think it was either someone really smart or it was potentially Gambino himself LARPing as someone who cracks the code on Reddit. That's very possible as well to be honest. Because it was months after the release of the Kwai EP before people found out the finished song was even out there. So people believe that Gambino LARPed as someone else and just leaked it, but that's a conspiracy, I guess. Either way, that's the story behind the 3005 Beach remix on the Kwai EP. You can listen to the full version on YouTube. Donald's saying he is writing a trilogy of films right now. So just recently of me writing this, Gambino stated while in the bathtub or something, it sounds like some sort of voicemail recording, and he said he would do a Q&A for three questions, and Gambino says he's actually writing a trilogy of films right now. Dash Laurent asks about uh, movies. I wrote and am writing about, uh, I'm writing three movies, a trilogy. Um, and yeah, hopefully they'll be done soon, so. No idea what these films are about and how far they're in development, but Gambino says they are being written. Who knows if they'll see the light of day or not, it's up to speculation, I guess. Gambino is writing, he is grinding, he also said he has no idea when the next album is dropping for those who are wanting to know. <laughs> Howard and Leslie. So this is a really weird YouTube channel called Howard and Leslie where supposedly the person who ran the channel is actually Donald Lover himself. Where I don't know if you were around during this time, but these videos were created in the early days of YouTube, but Donald made his own animation web series in a way. How people found this series is he linked it in some of the shorts for the official Childish Gambino website and linked a blog called Howard and Leslie, which this channel on YouTube is still up to this day if you want to watch it, I guess. It's pretty weird, but yeah, it's you can tell it's like early, you know, Gambino, early YouTube humor. In all honesty, they aren't that super interesting, but it's just really weird bottom of the iceberg type stuff. Donald Glover reposting stunt on your hose meme on Twitter, proving he lurks on his own subreddit. This is the story behind stunt on your hose, which is a reddit story. It's, it's a rabbit hole, and I was around during this time period so I can speak as someone who saw this happen. So this is really multiple stories in one, but I'll kind of conclude them together. So if you weren't a parent about the 3005 secret track, Donald Glover likes interacting with his fans in a low-key way. And it's also pretty obvious that he knows about his subreddit's existence. Now this became more apparent during the Awaken My Love era, where a user called Yes Stunt On These Hoes went on the entire subreddit and started spamming Stunt On These Hoes, four word phrase just over and over, Stunt On These Hoes, Stunt On These Hoes. Internet trolls are pretty common, so spam is, you know, common on the internet in general. But it's internet spam that happens all the time, you know? But this guy was seemingly going on every thread just posting Stunt On These Hoes, Stunt On These Hoes, Stunt On These Hoes. Now, what was the Reddit history of this account? There was no Reddit history in the, of this account. This was a brand new account just dedicated to spam on our Donald Lover's subreddit. So what did the mods do? Well, they banned this account for spamming. So this got people thinking, who was this guy? Why is he stunting on these hoes? Who is stunting on these hoes? A Reddit user who would later then make a meme of this situation of a Dexter's laboratory of Dexter praying in front of a Gambino poster saying, stunt on these hoes. Yes, this is the meme right here. And the man himself, Donald Glover, reposted this meme that was only on his subreddit, posted it on Twitter before quickly deleting it. Why would Donald do this? Why would Donald repost a meme from literally his obscure subreddit where it's even a meme of a situation that was going on on the subreddit? Well, everyone in our Donald Glover began shitting their pants because they later realized that they most likely banned Donald Glover himself from his own sub. 
Yeah, stunning your hose was most likely Donald Glover just trolling his fans on the low, and him reposting the meme on Twitter before quickly deleting it is a way to low-key call himself out for the people who understand what was going on. Because why the fuck would Donald repost this meme? It literally gives no context to him outside of the subreddit. And Donald Glover himself stated that he actually LARPs under many alter counts all the time, and this is something he just does. So everyone on our Donald Glover Reddit was going insane because they literally banned their senpai. Son on these hoes was later unbanned, but then he deleted his entire post history, and again, this type- Donald does this all the time, man. Son on these hoes. Another occasion of this happening is more recently of Donald lurking and just staying woke, I guess. Someone on Twitter posted this on Twitter. This is how Donald is built. Well, Donald saw this tweet and literally made it his profile picture for a while as a way of noticing this fan. Donald rarely like does anything on Twitter, so usually whenever he does something, it just becomes news. Just, just be, <laughs> just kind of get that. There are efforts to track down the accounts that Gambino supposedly runs on the low, some sort of like Salem Gambino trials in a way. But I feel like these are less of like truth of this stuff out there. It's mostly just speculation of people trying to find Gambino's supposed alt accounts. But I will be leaving that stuff out because it's mainly speculation. There are a few counts like confirmed to be Gambino, like the Golden Molar is actually a reference account uh, from a character in the BTI script that Gambino actually made himself to exist on the internet. There are a few other speculated Gambino alt accounts, but honestly finding them is like finding a needle in the haystack. So I'm just going to leave those out. Just know Gambino is among us. If you're out there Gambino, what's up? <laughs> Moving on. Childish Gambino saying he fucked Allison Brie in a live freestyle. So probably a lot of people have never seen this video at all, it doesn't have a lot of views, but it was during the I Am Donald tour in 2012, where Gambino began doing a freestyle, and during the one minute mark of the freestyle he drops a bar, I used to fuck Allison Brie. This video has only 5,000 views, and it's from 2012, but in some of the smaller Gambino communities, they began to speculate. If these two castmates actually had a relationship or anything like that, or if Gambino is saying any truth in this bar, or whatever. This bar was later reused on the song Sour Face, where he would again use this exact bar, pretty much. Alison Brie did write a book as well about where she just mainly talks about her sex life, so who knows, maybe, you know, they were doing stuff back in the day. <laughs> there are pictures of them on flights and cast of community, so honestly I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, it was something they did back in the day. They were on the show for a long period of time, I'm, it's not surprising that people do this. People speculate if the bar is just Gambino saying what he actually did or if it's some sort of exaggeration in a way. Not a lot of people know about this bar that it even exists, so that's why I put it at the very bottom of the iceberg. Roscoe's wetsuit. So I put this near the end intentionally. This is really the jewel of Gambino stuff, so what is Roscoe's wetsuit? During the BTI era, there was a bunch of billboards that began popping up with just plain white background and black text saying Roscoe's wetsuit. Now what is Roscoe's wetsuit? Is it a brand? Is it an actual wetsuit store? Well, actually the phrase began to pop up multiple times during the BTI screenplay, where plenty of characters would just simply say the phrase without knowing what it meant. During a live Q&A during the BTI era, fans were actually given a chance to interview Gambino in person, and someone in the crowd asked what Roscoe's wetsuit was, and Gambino responded, yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> you guys will see. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I can't, uh, I can't, it's, it's all part of bigger things too, but like, yeah. it's, it's just, but just remember asking your, like, okay. remember asking why, why you want to know, because that's part of it. Why, why, why do you, do you know why you want to know? Uh, curiosity. Just, yeah, you, know, you just want to know? Uh, yeah. yeah, right? Okay, yeah. cool, remember that. I feel like you're deep like, <laughs> yeah. like this kid right here. So what does this mysterious phrase mean? Well, it means nothing. The point of the phrase is to show how the internet will make something viral for literally no reason, and all it takes is one person to retweet something and people just want to know what it means. Showing that things on the internet are utterly meaningless, but yeah, yet we still want to know more. Which is what Gambino is trying to show by saying the phrase all the time on Twitter and in the BTI screenplay. 
It's the show how it, little it takes to make something viral on the internet, yet people want to know what it means so they feel like they're a part of something. Alright guys, so that is the end of the iceberg. This was a very long video. I put a lot of time in this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, make sure you subscribe if you want more content. I obviously am a huge Gambino fan. So if you guys liked this video, I appreciate it. Like, comment, and subscribe. You know, boost that in the algorithm. Boost it in the algorithm for me, please. <laughs> I don't care, actually. But anyways, if you guys uh, liked the video, be sure to let me know. Uh, there is a Patreon in the description if you guys are interested. I appreciate you guys for watching. This video took a lot of my life. <laughs> it took a lot of time to make. It was a long video. So I hope you guys enjoy. I hope you guys take care. You guys have a good one. Shout out to my Patreons and peace.